welcome to our monthly get together. Shively and Shoulders, and Mr. Shoulders is with us. It's good to be here. here. Well. It's good to be here with you, Judge. How about those Olympic Games? The more interesting part is going to be the fact that they'll be in LA in 2028. Well, I think that's right, and this is going to be a hard act to follow. I think Paris did it proud. The last Olympics and the one before that, kind of COVID and all of that. It just this had a spirit. Our our team performed. You know, I just thought it was. I'm already in withdrawal. Well, the thing was so neat about it. They had activities from downtown Paris out to Versailles to Tahiti. <laughs> Absolutely. They, they, wow. they, they just really did it right. And of course, there's not much else going on other than the Swift Boat veterans well, appear well, to be back out I, I, after Vice Presidential I Candidate I, Walls. I don't, I'm going to veto you right now. Okay. We're not going to talk about... Well, you are a judge. We're not going to talk about stuff until we talk about good news. Good news. The last... I said it was going to be therapeutic. ...segment of I-69 was completed last week. It's done. Un. Believable. Well, I, I was. I drove uh, three weeks ago, and you still couldn't get on 465. That's the way you easy. drive. There's that. Um, but right now, that even. Yeah. All that's done. In fact, in fact, they had Governor Holcomb, Governor Daniels, and Governor Pence all there at that new place where I-69 and 465 come together. It's a shame, may he rest in peace, that Governor Frank O'Bannon couldn't join them because he took the heat on the very first studies back when we were arguing which route, remember that? It has been a bipartisan effort going back to when there was a Democratic Party in this state. And that leads me to, to a very good question. Good. What's happened to the Democrat Party? Where have you been in the Himalayas? I mean, what do you mean? I mean, in we've Indiana, recaptured all of the momentum except, in this country. Except Indiana. Well, what's going on in Indiana? Indiana is so red that Santa won't even come here. Well, how did that happen? You know, I have a theory on that. In Evan Bay Bi Evan Bi was one of the most popular governors in the nation. His father, Bruce Bay, was a the best senator we've had in the hundred years. Um, Mitch came along. After O'Bannon, uh, and, and there was a, a, but the fact is, here's my theory on all of that. In the 1920s, this state was in the grip of the Ku Klux Klan. We had a governor that was a Klan. We had a mayor of Evansville that was in the Klan. And this state and a lot of this country was in the grip of this anti-immigrant nonsense. And we're right back there. I believe Donald Trump will burn out, flame out in this election. And the Republican Party that you used to be a member of, you were not a okay. MAGA type, will get back to being a conservative, limited government, personal freedom, all the things, a strong Pat, defense, all the things they talked about. It doesn't explain what has happened in recent history Well, in I, India. I, I, mm, recent, Mitch, I, I, Mitch realigned. And I will say they played the long game. They started worrying about legislative seats. They got people... And locally, I mean, Wendy McNamara taught at Bossy High School. They recruited candidates, and I, you know, I got to salute them for that. But, but, Mike Pence was no Mitch Daniels, no. and the idiot that you've nominated for lieutenant governor, who God speaks to, ladies and gentlemen, uh, in his sleep, one hopes he remains asleep. Uh, you're speaking. Uh, that's about, who you're nominating now. You're speaking about the good Reverend. Micah Beckwith. <laughs> Indeed, the Christian nationalist who believes that we should kind of get religion back in the schools, uh, he'll accuse us of what? Probably taking fluoride out of the water and all kinds of other criminal events. Is the fluoride not out of the water yet? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, but you and I didn't have, our kids didn't have cavities because there was fluoride in the water. How about the fact that the Democrats, and we're going to talk about this tonight with some delegates, have recaptured the excitement and the momentum in this country. And here Don, loser Don, thought it was going to be a coronation. Uh, not so fast. I said this on this program several weeks ago, long before all this, these recent events took place. The biggest challenge both parties were going to have in this election was getting the vote out. Because neither Biden nor Don. Trump 
Yes. We're really motivating voters to get out. No, and the orange right. monster now rambles. Eli, Elon Musk, two hours, and the man slurs his words. Here's what's happened. And I give the Democrats credit for this. Mm -hmm. It's a lot like Listen what up. They rolled out the vice president, Kamala Harris, new, fresh face. He's not necessarily new, but a fresh approach talking about joy, positive Indeed. things. Anybody will tell you, if you want to give a speech, you want to impress somebody, you talk about the positive things that are going on. This is what they're doing. And the issues. Don just wants to talk about himself. But we've teed it up because tonight's show, stay tuned. We're going to let some, we're going to allow Dr. Hanka Hanka Burnin' Love back on the show to try to redeem himself. He's 0 for 2 in predictions. And we've got some delegates that are going to go up to the Democratic National Convention next week. Up to Chicago. He's going to be re reliving 1968 all over again? I don't think so. Okay. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. We're back with one of our favorite guests, even though Pat is very rude to him. <laughs> Political science professor from USI, Professor Matt Hanka. Glad to have you back. Thank you, Judge Shively. Thank you, Mr. Schultz. Dr. Hanka Hanka Burning Love. There we go. Now, let me think. <laughs> you picked Cheryl to be mayor. Mm. You picked Cheryl to win commissioner. Mm. Is she running for any? Are you going to pick her to be governor? I think we're we talking about the presidential election. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome back. It's good to you, have you. you. Thank you thank it's you. like picking the weather. I understand and, and how difficult right. can this be. Yeah. Uh, Les tells me you have a book out. Yeah, I wrote a book on community development, uh, what is happening in your community. So a lot of the work I did when I was living in Louisville and then working with uh, groups in Evansville, just a sort of showcase of important things and kind of a model of community of comprehensive community development. I talk about collective impact. And I use a lot of case studies of things being done here in Evansville to showcase the Promise Zone as a collective impact initiative um, and other stuff. So, yeah. Interesting. Speaking of communities and impacts and things, we've got a Democratic convention yes, coming do. up. We have a presidential election. Just, just riff about, from a political scientist standpoint, of how you see the fall. Fall turnout. Well, this is going to be very interesting because... Kamala Harris is running a 90, 100-day campaign, and we haven't seen this in a very long time. So she's had to mobilize support. It took 16 days, a very quick 16 days to get her to um, pick a vice presidential nominee, but she's um, enjoying a lot of good momentum right now. She's enjoying um, a lot of the, the upswing from having um, Governor Walls on, on her ticket. You think that's uh, a good pick? It's, it's a good pick because it aligns with a lot of her progressive values. Now... Whether it lines up with what the rest of the country wants um, remains to be seen. There may be a lot of folks out there who are looking at, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to take Trump a third time, but may see some of her progressive and Governor Wall's progressive band of politics a little too much, too. Today, so. qu today quite by accident, I was watching MSNBC. I don't know what the heck happened. Whoa. <laughs> but they had Nate Silver on. Sure. Who was so wrong about the Hillary's race, but go but ahead. But he nailed it with the 2012 election. Nate Silver, he gave his prognostications for this 2024 presidential election year, said things are looking favorable for the Democrat ticket. Right. However, one thing he said towards the end, he said, you should not rely on polls anymore. Polls are unreliable. Right. Well, so, a lot of them so, are. Let me ask you this. If polls are unreliable, how do people like you and Nate Silver predict what's going to happen? Well, there's this thing that has, <laughs> and maybe some of you have heard of the Bradley effect. It's also called the social desirability effect. And this is social scientists who use it as a way of, so when people sometimes, when it comes to polling, that they may not be very truthful to the pollster. So this happened, why it's called the Bradley effect, is that people, when they were polled, Mayor, uh, Tom Bradley was the, the uh, first African-American mayor of Los Angeles, and... When they were polling him, so are you going to support for mayor? He thought he was going to lose. He didn't get that support, and he won. So what has happened, and this also was an effect in 2016. People are lying to the pollsters. So we have to take that into account that whatever we're getting is, is, is perhaps sort of muddled in this, in this not getting the truth. But we do polling because that's the best way of what we capture. <laughs> it's all the, we got. The, the sentiment, it's all we got. We can't count every <laughs> single human being. And so this is the best way we can get based upon 
a representative sample. Now, obviously, we, we can control on the kind of sample and the margin of errors we have, and we can have error there. But even if you have a plus or minus 3% margin of error and a representative sample, still can't rely on that outlier of, or of somebody just saying, hey, I'm not going to admit to this right. person that I voted for Donald Trump or Kamala Harris or whoever, depending. The Wall Street Journal today, lead editorial, says Trump is looking like a loser again. Okay. And forget the headline. They do a very in-depth analysis of what's going on right now. All right. And they draw a comparison between 2016 and 2024, right. making this analogy. Hillary Clinton was probably one of the most unfavorably approached candidates. Right. And all of a sudden, Donald Trump is the new right. thing on the block. Right. Kamala Harris is having the same effect, don't you think? Nobody really was, people were not walking out the door to go for Biden or vote for Trump. One of the biggest challenges of both parties was to get the vote out. Right. Her message of joy, positive, is that what's moving the, the clock, you think? It's just a new energy. The yeah. fact that the old energy was there and depending on what people want to say, uh, whether it's forced out or, or not, that energy isn't there. And so if you had a poll, you know, it was one thing. If you, if you did a poll or you had the vote in June right. or May, it's possible, you know, Biden could have won, Jerome would have That's won, right. but you have this process of a campaign. And just people did not see him as somebody to be able to put the energy in that remaining couple, 100 plus days. It's possible that maybe the Biden people were masking the problem and the problem was, was worse than it is. This new energy is, is helping. Now, Kamala is still, for being four years, this is just the nature of the vice presidency. You're hidden, you're managed, right. you're seeming relevant. So she's having to introduce her policies in a way. And that's why we haven't seen... We only had one person in maybe sort of 180 years who was the sitting vice president who became president, that's George right. H.W. Bush. And that hadn't happened even in 150 years. So it, it's tough for that. Um, it's going to be, be tough for her to continue to have that. And she might, be, might not have as much time as she should. Less, or than, as other, you know, less than 90 days. Less, less than 90 days. It's possible the, the clock right. could run out. But let she's got to work hard me, at that. Let me ask you this. Here's what I just can't get. If today I said, ladies and gentlemen, Kamala Harris has had five children by three different husbands. Kamala Harris has a half a billion dollar civil judgment against her for what was alleged as fraud. And Kamala Harris has been convicted of 34 felonies. Fox be News. Beyond outrage, yeah. My God, there would be dying laughing across this country. That's what you've nominated? How does he, how, do, how, how is he a viable candidate? It's, it's authoritative personality. It's the cult of personality. It's the fact that Donald Trump has been around in people's lives for 40, 50 years. And he's had several lives and iterations. People knew of Trump, the 80s New York social life. Then they knew him as the 2000 celebrity candidate. And now he comes in and he has in, in 2015, 16 with this message of, hey, everything's broken. Hillary's broken. The whole thing is. And I'm going to build a great, wall in Mexico. And we're going to do that. Yeah, this is we're getting to the third time that the Republican Party has put all their chips in this Trump basket. <laughs> and if he wins, he's barely going to win because what is going to probably benefit him may not even win the popularity is going to benefit from the Electoral College, and the Electoral College rewards space and geography, especially when you have a winner-take-all all system and, and, and the like. So, so people have sort of decided to put their lot in Trump, again, because they see what they want in America, and they are so vested in him in ways. And this is, you know, cultist personality, whatever you want to call, call a lot of this, people are not. You're going to have that block of people. It doesn't matter what he says or does. They're not going to leave him of all the things that you said that he has been doing. And then it just puts someone like a Kamala up against it where they're even, they're even imagining things that she might have done and not done and, point, and trying to throw that on the wall to see, will this In the time stick? we have left, unlike Patrick, Professor, I don't think you're a loser. <laughs> I think he's he's over for two. Well, he's, this is his chance. To, oh, okay. This, this is the, like, double jeopardy. This is the big one. 
This is the big one. Yeah. The big one. Who is going to win? Who is going to win this? And not tell me who, but tell me why. Harris is going to pull off the key states that she needs to win to get the 270 for a slim majority in the Electoral College. There you go. With that, we'll see if this is the redemption tour <laughs> for the good professor. If not, then, then you know people will say, but hey, it's politics and being well, one thing, it's always a jump ball, right? No, which, which way do you go? If you screw up or if you get it right, you're going to be back. <laughs> well, Nate Silver got it all wrong in 2016. Look at the cottage industry. He when has. we come back, delegates to the Democratic National Convention right here with Shively and Shoulder. Well, we continue our discussion about the dynamics of 2024 with two delegates to the Democrat, by the way, it's not the Democrat, Democrat National Convention, Alex Burton and Allison Shelby. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having us. Yes, it is you. great to have you here. Alex, you are running for state representative, unopposed. Yes. The seat occupied by David Hatfield. Ryan. Ryan. Ryan Hatfield. David is the lawyer. His, well, his dad. And Allison, you are elected uh, city council? Newburgh Town Council. Newburgh Town Council. So I admire both of you. I always had on my bucket list, I wanted to be a delegate to a national convention, never got it done. You know, people have different interests. I think I'll grow tomatoes this year. I'll learn to sail. You said, I want to go to the, why? Well, I actually was elected to go four years ago. But COVID happened, and they didn't have the convention in person. We participated remotely in a few events here and there. So uh, I decided to throw my name in the hat again this year with the hope that there would be some sympathy for the fact that I didn't actually get to attend in person, and so they'd send me again this time so I could have the full experience. Why is it that you want to do this? Well, I've been a member of the Democratic Party my entire life, an elected official now for five or six years. And um, I just thought it's, it's one of those things that as somebody who has been a part of the process almost their entire lives, that it's just that one piece of the process that is really appealing. It's fun, it's exciting, and even more exciting after the past few weeks. And so as a Democrat, I can't imagine anything more fun to be a part of than to celebrate who might be our nation's next leader. And Alex, you've been through all the battles of city council, all of that stuff. What do you want to do this for? Uh, well, so this will be like, like Allison, I was a delegate in 2020, but mm -hmm. we didn't get a chance to go to Milwaukee. And then in 2016, I was a page. Um, and so for you know, now I wanted to have that full experience and be, um, be a delegate at um, in Chicago, and before the new change, I really was like, okay, no more conventions in Chicago. Um, now I think I'm okay if another convention eventually went to Chicago. Um, but but yeah, I'm I'm just excited, um, especially in the past few weeks. New energies came across, uh, and people are are paying attention. And um, who knows, we may even uh, pull a 2008 and Indiana may go blue. There you go. I like that kind of thing. Um. This is kind of a basic, maybe it sounds like a crass comment, but Chicago is a little bit of an expensive town to visit. Are your expenses being picked up by the party? Or are you guys on your own? No, we're responsible for our own wow. expenses, and you know, there's, there's options to help try to defray the costs. But yeah, it's So you guys it's are really us. making a commitment. Mm -hmm. But I'll bet you they'll never have to buy a drink. <laughs> I bet there'll be some, some entertainment so? suites and that sort of thing. I'm just guessing. Um, so, a lot of people think about a Democrat convention in Chicago, think about 1968. Tell me, Allison, why this is not going to be a rerun of 68. Well, I think for one thing, as you've seen the last few weeks or so, this Democratic campaign is one of joy and happiness and looking for the best in our country. I think that there's not... Um, that you, that our party is united, and it's a different atmosphere within the party than I think might have existed in 1968. And Neither I think, of these two was born in 1968. That is true. But I it's was, her birthday I, was in <laughs> I think I was in kindergarten then. <laughs> um, I think you're right. I, there, I, there could be some Israeli-Palestinian, but it will not be, I don't, 
my prediction. I don't think it'll be the young people storming and the police with batons and Mayor Daley and everything we remember. Uh, seriously, you, Pat brought up a good point. One of the aspects of Kamala Harris's euphoric ventures thus far, one of the negative things has been she's been interrupted during some of her appearances by pro-Palestinian people. Do you think the Palestinian-Israeli conflict is going to play a heavy role in the convention? Had, had President Biden stayed in the race, I think it would have, and there was certainly that potential. I think now there is a reset, and now that there is traction kind of happening uh, with the conflict, I, I think there's a real opportunity to reset and have the conversation and put that plan for, moving forward. Um, and, you know, I, I really see this moment as really a rallying cry um, for the Democrats, you know, there's two choices on the ballot. Um, one has um, an interesting past um, that and has been a former president, and uh, you know, Kamala's bringing a new energy um, with with Governor Walz that'll I, I think people are paying attention to, and you know, for you know, kind of bringing it back home to, to Indiana. This election is going to be decided by the teachers of, of this of this nation, um, and I think our teachers are fed up with the craziness and just want some some sanity and people who know what they're doing. And what better person to have um, in a leadership role than a teacher? A governor that was a teacher. So how you, you like that pick, in other words? I didn't. Allison? I like it a lot. I'm a daughter of two public school teachers. And so um, education has always been the center of our household. I think you know it's been the center of our country from founding fathers and John Adams and those people that we look up to. They knew that the key to a free democratic society was quality public education for everyone. I and I think we're getting right. back to those principles. The first locally elected officials were school board members. Right. Yeah. You know, I, I think that's right. And as the more I've thought about it, I was early thinking it has to be Josh Shapiro because maybe he can deliver Pennsylvania. But if you look at history, there hasn't been a vice presidential pick deliver a state right. since Lyndon Johnson in 1960. I think this pick also makes geographic sense. We didn't go to the coasts would pick somebody from the Big Ten, you know? And I, I think that makes a lot of sense as, as I kind of process that. Mm -hmm. um, here's what I also think. Four years ago, right after, uh, or eight years ago, right after I'm going to build a wall and Mexico's going to pay for it, was we're going to reverse Roe versus Wade. And I'm going to pick Supreme Court justices. And you know what? Don, the orange monster, delivered on that one. Except this year's Republican platform doesn't even mention it, and all of a sudden we've reshaped ourselves. Well, we always meant we were just going to take it back to the states. I think women's rights might deliver the presidency this year. And, and, and I think this convention, I hope, I don't know what your perspective is, really talks about that kind of freedom of choice. Absolutely. And I'll defer to, to, to. <laughs> I mean, it's a great time for women right now in general. It's a great time for women candidates. It, we have, you know, a woman leading our ticket for, um, you know, the second time in recent history. Um, we had more women athletes in the U.S. win Olympic medals than men this year. Um, just a success all around that I think is good for our party. It's good for our country. And, um, I think that there's a lot for women to be excited about. Well, I think it's time. We gave women, women didn't even have the vote till 1920, but that's been 100 years. It might be time, don't you think, Judge, to have a woman president? Well, it's time that we have a good president. <laughs> yes. Always time for that. Yes. Um, Boy, what, that was diplomatic, wasn't it? <laughs> uh, let me ask you folks, besides the official nomination voting that's going to be done, what other duties will you as delegates have? There's a lot of different caucus meetings during the day. Uh, there's also changes to the party platform that I believe were voted on. And so um, we have the opportunity to help shape the party's platform going forward. And really, you know, it's an opportunity to meet other people with our sure. same, you know, shared ideas and similarities. We get to go with our friends here locally and have this once in a lifetime potentially experience. And then we're going to meet you know, similar people from Illinois and Ohio and Florida and Colorado and all over the country um, that, you know, I think that this is what it's all about, is getting people together, sharing ideas, and doing the best we can when we come back locally. In the last minute, let's end where 
the judge started me a while ago, and that is, will this also maybe start to rebuild a party in this state? When I was your age, the kind of Democrats had nine of 11 congressional seats in this state, both senators and the governor. Now, we don't hardly have a coroner anywhere. Uh, 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 will you do some Democratic caucusing statewide kind of stuff? Yeah, I mean, you look at the success we've had here in Evansville. I mean, you know, we've, we have a Democratic mayor. Um, the, the number of cities in, in Indiana that have Democratic mayors right now is continuing to increase. Um, going into the state legislature, uh, hopefully we'll be able to chip away at the supermajority, which is only four seats. So um, there's some opportunity there. And it's not going to happen overnight. It's going to continue to... Um, having the conversations in neighborhoods so that so we can get to the point of having a real uh, machine that really advocates for democratic values. And a lot of it is, you know, sharing the good things that we are doing right now, making sure that information gets out there. You know, Alex does great work on the city council here and is going to be great in the state house. And I think that we do great things in Newburgh. I think I'm one of the most fiscally conservative members of our town council in Newburgh, but when people go to the ballot box and they just are looking at the name behind or the letter behind a candidate and not focusing on what's actually being done then that's that's the battle that we really have to overcome is that we are doing good work and we are doing work that we think everybody could relate to and be proud of to a certain extent I think our party's in good hands with great young people like this have a great time have fun in Chicago Thank you. Thank you. when we come back the judge will take another shot right at my forehead Judge, it's the Irish or the Scotch that say, may you be born or live in exciting times. These are exciting times. These are exciting times. And I'll tell you something. One thing I think is going to motivate voters in this election is not the D or R, but ideas. My father used to say, don't talk about people and personalities. We want to impress people, talk about ideas. The, the Trump campaign right now, he can't help himself. All he wants to do is use nicknames for his opponents. Talk about crowd size. Crowd and things like that. And when I, I watched the evening that uh, Waltz was announced, and watched the whole thing. My wife watches CNN. See, I'm, I get voted out at home, but I sense from that, even though I disagree with their, what they have done politically and what they believe in, but the joy, the happiness, the, it's going to be better tomorrow. Here's what we're going to do. I mean, those things really resonate with voters and get them motivated. Well, I, I think that's right. I, I, I long for a time. You, you and I grew up together. I respected the Republican Party that you used to be a member of. The, the discussion should be about the role of government. It should be about the use of our tax dollars. It should be about a strong America. It ought to be about issues. It should not be about personality and personality assassination. And it should be the peaceful transfer of power. And we ought to respect our elections. We've gotten away from that. And I believe if Donald Trump is defeated this time, the cult, the, the, the fever will be broken and a, and a Republican Party will reemerge. That's my hope. Well, it's not that the Republican Party will reemerge. I hope that happens. But I think the pendulum will start swinging towards the middle and will be more focused on, as your good friend Evan Bay used to say, good government is good politics. Absolutely. And he was certainly in the middle. Thank you all for joining Shively and Shoulders. See you next month.